That's a very complex question, what is sensory processing disorder? The reason it's complex is the six different subtypes of the disorder. But a basic definition is difficulty interpreting sensory information that comes into the brain. So the information comes in and it's sort of garbled in the transmission from the outside environment into a meaningful response. So information is detected, it is then interpreted, and the person responds. But anywhere along that pathway, you could have a problem, and that would be called a sensory processing disorder. And what does it look like to an observer, or a parent, or a teacher? What will be the signs that might indicate this child may have difficulties integrating and processing sensory input? So it's interesting because the output, the problem area you see is not sensory because sensory is what comes in to cause the problem. But the problem is a motor problem, a behavior problem, an emotion problem, an attention problem. So it's sometimes very complex to determine if the child does have a true sensory processing disorder. You asked what some of the symptoms are. And of course, I mentioned there were six subtypes. So one subtype, for example, is over-responsive. This child responds too quickly. Maybe sounds hurt their ears or touch makes them aggressive. So the hard thing about sensory processing disorder is that no two children look alike and many symptoms can be sensory processing disorder. So it takes you some training to really understand what is and what isn't a sensory processing disorder. The first thing you asked is, what do you do if you suspect a problem? There are many places where you can read about red flags of sensory processing disorder. For example, our website lists many red flags, or my book, Sensational Kids, lists red flags, and there are many other places also that you can read about it. If your child meets a certain number of those, what you want to do is get a multidisciplinary evaluation, a big word that means an evaluation by a number of different professionals together. In some places, you might have to go here, here, here to get numerous people, but the best way is to get an evaluation by a team that all works together, that has worked together for a while and understand each other's professions. So this would include typically a pediatrician, an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, sometimes a physical therapist if there's a motor problem, almost always a psychologist, and um, there are occasionally other professionals who are also included. So once we have done the assessment, what would be the next step? If the child does turn out to have a sensory processing disorder, you would want to find a place to do treatment. Treatment is typically provided by occupational therapists, but not all occupational therapists are trained in sensory treatments. Um, and there's a lot of variability in the kind of training that people have. So in my opinion, the best trained occupational therapists are ones who have been mentored to do treatment in sensory processing because there are very few schools that teach really excellent treatment. So the only way really to learn to be a really excellent provider is to be trained by somebody who mm -hmm. has been practicing for a while. And what does the treatment for sensory processing disorders look like? Because there is quite a lot of information on different protocols that are used by occupational therapies, such mm -hmm. as a brushing protocol or a reflex integration therapy or the auditory integration therapy or a sensory diet. How sensory integration treatment is different? So all of those things would be called sensory integration treatment by some people. And it depends on your philosophy. At the STAR Center and at the Sensory Processing Disorder Foundation, I have been studying sensory processing disorder, as you know, for 40 years. In our work, we use a type of treatment that is relationship-based. So this is very different than a, an intervention that is protocol-based. Something such as the brushing protocol is done the same way with every child, every day, no matter what. There is a process called clinical reasoning, which I know you're quite aware of, which is means you use your wisdom 
to individualize the treatment for every child in every moment, depending on the child's situation and the context that they're in. In my work, I have found that the most important aspect of occupational therapy is the relationship you form with the family, not even the child, but the family. And we believe that the most effective treatment is that treatment which occurs every day, or at least three times a week, for a short period of time, maybe six weeks or something, a couple of months maybe, and where the focus is on what we call smart play. Smart is sensory, motor, authentic, relationship rich, therapeutic play. So the point is that we coach families to be authentic in playing with their children and do not focus on developmental strengths. So in other words, I, my goal for your child is not that he has good fine motor skills. It's not that he can kick a ball or that he knows his ABCs. My goal for your child is his joy in life. And the way he gets joy in life is by your relationship with him. Once a child feels secure and happy, they will go on their own to have developmental gains. This is, by the way, not, not something everybody believes. So many places where you might take your child to get treatment, their goals are much more developmental. And it depends on you as a parent where you want to see the emphasis placed. Unfortunately, there is a philosophy in the UK and even in the US as well that children with special needs need to be made normal. They need to be fixed. And this makes everybody very unhappy because they spend all their time fixing their children. We don't believe in fixing children. We believe in making families happy. And if you can bring happiness through play to families, to parents and children, everybody makes more gains. That's our philosophy. That's very interesting, thank you. And now, you, you have been an active researcher since the 70s. Uh, how do you see the stages of the research and theory development in sensory processing disorders and what do you feel the future holds? Dr. Jean Ayers was the greatest researcher we had in the field. She was actively researching in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and part of the 80s, but she passed away in 1988. After she passed away, there was a sort of hiatus on research because I think people were afraid to go outside the knowledge area that she had created. Dr. Ayers herself was always moving forward. People got mad because every time we'd get together for a meeting, she'd change this, she'd change that. The syndrome used to be defined this way, now it's defined that way. But true researchers are like that. They change things because they get new knowledge. So I think we stagnated for a while and there was no new knowledge for quite a few couple of decades. In our work, what I have tried to do is bring in experts outside the field of OT people with expertise in epidemiology, neuroscience, social science, psychiatry, bring them together to create an outside the box kind of treatment and an outside the box kind of research. So now we're in a stage where over the last 10 years, tremendous research growth has been made. We now have twin studies, we have primate studies, we have rat studies, we have fMRI studies, we have neurotransmitter studies, I mean, there are just so many excellent, excellent studies. Hopefully, this is the beginning of a revolution and a way of thinking that, that will create a whole new paradigm in terms of understanding sensory processing disorder. We're so close, but it will take a groundswell of, from the bottom up, um, mm -hmm. of support from parents and professionals to see this happen in the next decade. So it's a very exciting time ahead. It is. And my final question is, you recently had a publication in the new textbook for multisensory integration, uh, where there is a chapter dedicated to sensory processing disorders. Would you like to tell us more about, about this publication and also taking sensory processing disorders outside of the field of occupational therapy and raising awareness in the whole multisensory integration community? It's, it's more than multisensory 
integration. That is just one of the communities where we're raising awareness. The thing is, OTs are not trained in research. Everybody says you must do evidence-based work, but then they don't train you. So what we have is a situation where the OTs are not trained, and yet the field is expected to have the same kind of rigor as medicine and psychology. So what I've tried to do is bring together rigorous scientists with master clinicians and have them work in teams so that the research can be rigorous and scientific and still relate to the clinical issues. The chapter that you're talking about is a chapter about translational research, which means from bench to bedside, from cell to applied behavior. And it's, it's, a, it's a plea for both sides, the neuroscience and the OT, to work together to make meaningful research in sensory processing. And I think this will be happening over the next decade. Brilliant. So there is a very optimistic future for sensory integration and sensory processing. Definitely, yes. We see a lot of parents who come to us completely overwhelmed by what's happening in their lives and with their children. What do you say to parents and families that come um, distraught and wondering how to manage children who have sensory processing issues? The first thing you tell parents is, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. We have to pace you and we have to pace your child. We will take one foot in front of the other until we come to a place where everyone is happy, but it's not gonna happen overnight and it's going to take some time. I think parents need support. Rather than starting with specifics, what you need to start with is listening. Tell me about your child. Tell me about what this has been like for you. You know there's so many parents like you. And agree with them and make validate their feelings. And that will go a long way towards helping them get started. Not starting with, here's a list of 10 things you should do when you go home tonight. No. That, they may say that's what they want, but that isn't what they want. At first, they need to be heard. Yes. And if there were a few things a parent could do in the initial stages of coming to see an experienced therapist, what would those few things be that a parent could do to make things easier? The most important thing a parent can do is to spend time playing with their child. And it's not just play. It's a time when the parent can relate to their child, make their child feel important, make their child feel normal, and share joy. There has to be a shared feeling of success between the child and the parent. We call those magic moments. And when a child comes into OT, they have many, many magic moments with their OT. But the OTs need to learn to transfer those magic moments to the parents. And I have a little formula. It's not exact, but I tell parents that well, however much time they're spending working on the child's deficits or, or problem areas, they should be spending the same amount, if not more, working on their strengths. However much time they're spending in therapy, they should be spending the same amount of time playing. So they say, I say, how much time do you have in OT? Well, an hour. Okay, how long does it take to get there? Well, a half an hour. And back is another half hour, that's two hours. So my formula is for every two hours that they spend in that OT session, the child deserves, and the parent too, two hours of play. On the floor, playing, not also doing the dishes, not also making dinner, playing. And that play does more to mend what is the problem that the child is having than therapy sometimes does. Yes, thank you. And a lot of parents struggle with meltdowns that their children are having. Are there some key things that you can give us that a parent could mm -hmm. do to So you heard around? practice makes perfect, right? Yes. Right. Well, you don't practice when the child's in the middle of his meltdown. What you do is you set up a situation where you and the child are practicing regulated behavior. So for example, I know when my child melts down, I'm supposed to be very calm, which I never can be, and I'm supposed to pick up this child and put him someplace that is not a loaded place, not his bedroom, not a bathroom, maybe the laundry room, until the child self-regulates. So what do I do? I practice that. How do I practice it? I do a pretend. I say, okay, Joe, little Joe, 
Um, you're, uh, we know you have a problem with crying. And so we're gonna play a game today. Mommy is gonna be the crier. And you, little Joe, you are gonna tell mommy where to go until it's time for mommy to come back out because she feels she can be regulated or smooth and not cry. So you practice with you, the child, and you, the mother, switching roles or switching into different roles, back and forth, until you form a pattern of what is gonna happen during the meltdown. And what should happen, what works the best, is with no affect, no anger, you pick up the child, you bring them to some place that they know ahead of time, and they have as much time as they need to get themselves together. We call this time in, because so many people put kids in time out. Time in is a different idea. It's a place where children can go to put themselves together. And ideally, they will start going to time in when they start to fall apart, before they fall apart, and then come back out. I mean, that's the ultimate goal. That's a lovely thing to hear, because you hear so much time out, time out. Exactly. Um, one other question I had was, a lot of parents who come to us are concerned about the frequency of therapy we might suggest because to change the brain and to change patterns of behavior it does take some time. You have a, a new program in America that you've started. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? My experience is that children get in, put into therapy once a week for the rest of their lives. Okay, that's a little exaggerated. Maybe it's once a week for five years. The program that we have is intensive. It's every day in a row, or at the least, three days in a week, over a short period of time, like two months or two and a half months. Then the child has a break, and the family has a break, and they do normal things. They go on picnics, they climb mountains. That wouldn't be normal here, but it's normal where I live. They go swimming, they go to the beach, they join a club, maybe a horseback riding club, or, or something fun but not therapeutic. If the child needs it, they can be touched, they can touch base once a week during that period, or better yet, we Skype or we do phone calls so that we can stay in touch with the families and they come back maybe in six months or a year. And this sort of intensive bursts of treatment seems to change the brain in a much more consistent way. Plus, it gives freedom to the family. It gives them a chance to try out everything they've learned, and it seems to work much better than once a week for the rest of your life. Yes, and on the affordability issue, if it's a, a private therapy that a parent is seeking, you um, have set up a, a new grand, grandkids, a new model. Right. Right. We yeah. have several mm -hmm. models. We yeah. have financing which we've arranged with the bank, so they just, pay the same amount every week that they would have for once a week therapy. That's one model. Another model is our grand, uh, grand kids model where the mother or the grandmother or the grandfather is paying for the treatment and they get a special certificate and they become part of our grand club. And um, we have other models too. We have just started a scholarship program where we get donations. We now have $100,000 now that we'll be giving out in donations to children who need therapy and can't afford it. So it's not perfect. It is true that children who have more money get more treatment, and that's not fair, but that's the way it is. And those children deserve treatment too. So we need to be conscious of children who can't afford it and do our best, but truly we can't treat everybody. So um, it's important to make as many possibilities for as many children as possible. And, and the way to do that is to train more people and increase awareness. And that's why we're here in the UK, is to spread the word. And your, your book, Sensational Kids, and No Longer a Secret, also help yes, so I many so. parents and families to do that as well. Thank you. One other question. Um, uh, the integrated listening system, you use it sometimes in mm -hmm. your therapy. Do you feel that that is a, a useful approach with certain yeah. children? You know, my answer to all these questions about what works is it depends. And it depends so much on the individual child. And what scares me is that people go to a workshop on integrative listening or interactive metronome or the Will Barger protocol or da, 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 many of these things 
and then they do it with everybody. It's not a miracle answer. It depends on the symptoms the child is displaying and you must have a hypothesis. What do you think is gonna change if you use integrated listening? You don't just do it because it's there and you don't do it with every child and you don't do it the same with every child. So if you have enough knowledge to use it wisely, it can be very effective. If not, you know, you may as well just be on the playground playing. Thank you. Okay. I think that's perfect. Thank okay. you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs>